So <coughs> last week we uh, took a little time where we thought about things that others may have said to us or things that the enemy has maybe put into our uh, minds at times or even things that we've told ourselves when things in our lives didn't go uh, the right way or how we hoped they would and maybe we started to put ourselves down. There are many uh, thoughts that we have in our lives that uh, tend to weigh us down and sometimes we hold on to those when we need to let go of those and give them over to God and allow him to, like we were saying, cast them into the fire. Uh, we then read several verses about who we are in Christ and how Christ gives a white stone to those who overcome. We read out of Revelation. And uh, we said like when a Roman trial took place that at the end of the trial, the judges would all cast either a black stone or a white stone to proclaim whether they thought the person was guilty or not guilty. And Christ casting a white stone was proclaiming that he has weighed the evidence and he has decided that we are not guilty. And then also how uh, stones were used in voting in public elections among the Greeks and the citizens. If they were against an issue, they could place a black stone into the large vase. Or if they were supportive of an issue, they could place a white stone into the vase, that they were supporting it. <clears throat> So uh, how awesome is it that Christ is not just finding us not guilty, but he is also placing his support behind us. He is voting for you. <coughs> I want to continue this week looking at our identity. If I travel and I need to rent a car or get a hotel room or something, they're going to usually ask for a credit card and to see my ID. My ID has a picture of me on it and describes what I look like, even tells where I live. <laughs> Most of us in this digital age, we have several passwords that we use. Uh, we might even use protective software and other ways that we try to protect our identity in some way. One of the great fears among many of people, especially in Western society, is that of losing their identity. I've received many calls and emails over the years wanting me to purchase uh, coverage to help protect my identity. And even though it's important to have this kind of identity in regards to our finances and possessions, there's a much more important identity, which is based on who and what we are, rather than on what we own. Even if I find my identity in how I look or in what I do for a living, those kinds of identity can be lost. The most important part of your identity, no one can take away from you. I remember years ago hearing about Sheila Walsh. Sheila was a well-known <laughs> Christian singer, and she was co-host on the 700 Club. And she went through a period of depression. And during this time, she uh, ended up seeing it was a psychologist or a psychiatrist and actually received some mental health treatment where they asked her, who are you? And all of her answers, from what I remember reading, were, well, this is what I do, and this is how busy I am. And they're like, okay, those are things that you do with your life, but who are you? And at that point, she didn't know. Who am I outside of my job? Who am I outside of all the work I do, of what I pour myself into? And many of us find our identity in what we do, in what we accomplish, rather than who we truly are. Years ago, I was watching my daughters playing, and they loved to get dressed up, and they uh, were pretending to be princesses like they had many times before. As I was enjoying watching them pretend, pretending to be royalty, God used that moment to speak to me. I was challenged with the thought, at what age do you stop believing that you are royalty? Are only little children allowed to believe that they're princes and princesses? Or do you know who you are? It took that moment for the light bulb to come on for me, and I'm sad to say that there's many times where I have to be reminded of that. Galatians 4, verses 6 and 7 says, Because you are sons... God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. 
Are you hearing this verse? We're in the Christmas season right now, and you might be out buying presents. What better present could you receive from God than to be called a son or a daughter? And yet so many of us, we might claim we know that, but do we really? Has it reached the core of our identity of our being? We would say, I am a son or I am a daughter of God? And as his children, we get all of the benefits that come with that, for we aren't just sons or daughters, we are heirs. Do you know who your daddy is? I mean, that's a popular phrase, right? Who's your daddy? <laughs> well, we might all have earthly daddies, but if you're in Christ, your daddy is the king of kings and the lord of lords, and guess what that makes you? Royalty. Romans 8, verses 14 to 17. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are his children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Once again, when we are in Christ, we have been brought into God's family. We are the sons and daughters of God, who have such an intimate relationship that we can call him Daddy. Our tendency is too often to degrade ourselves and disqualify ourselves from who we really are. The Spirit of God is testifying with our spirit that we are God's children. As children, we have now become heirs. We now have full privileges of this new birthright that we may share in all that God is. Yes, this means we share in his suffering, but all the more that we would share in his glory. As Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Why do we have such a problem accepting this? We know we're the children of God, the very heirs of the King of Kings, and yet so often we see ourselves not very different than those who are still lost find themselves. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Before Jesus was led into the desert and tempted, what were the words of his Father echoing in his heart and his mind? I am the beloved Son of God. Do you know that God says the same thing to you and to me? You are the beloved son, the beloved daughter of God. Blaise Pascal wrote, God made man in his image, and man returned the compliment. Therefore, if I feel hateful or disgust or anything like that with myself, then I assume that God feels the same way. It's easy for us to feel loved by God when our lives are together. Then acceptance of ourselves is easy. In these times, we might even say that we liked ourselves. When we're in control, we feel strong. We might even begin to feel a sense of security. What happens, though, when your life begins to fall apart? What happens when you get laid off? Your investments crash. Your spouse leaves you when you sin and you fail. What is your sense of self-worth during these times? Do you still feel like a beloved child of God. Does God's love for you depend on you having it all together and you being so-called good? How often are we treating God like Santa Claus and trying to figure out if we are on the nice or the naughty list? Is God's love conditional upon any circumstance even though we may be in poverty and broken? We must accept that God is relentlessly compassionate. 
and tender towards us just as we are, not in spite of our faults and our sins, but with them. Of course God does not promote or condone evil, but he does not withhold his love because there is evil in us. David Siemens wrote, Many Christians find themselves defeated by the most psychological weapon that Satan uses against them. This weapon has the effectiveness of a deadly missile. It's named low self-esteem. Satan's greatest psychological weapon is a gut-level feeling of inferiority, inadequacy, and low self-worth. This feeling shackles many Christians in spite of wonderful spiritual experiences and knowledge of God's word. Although they understand their position as sons and daughters of God, they are tied up in knots, bound by a terrible feeling of inferiority, and chained to a deep sense of worthlessness. Henry Nouwen said, Self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the Beloved. Being the beloved constitutes the core truth of our existence. The book of Jude begins by him writing, To those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. (coughs) I used to wake up in the morning, and in my mind I would do a self-assessment of how I thought I was doing. Where had I been sinful? What have my attitudes been like? And not that self-assessment is bad. We do want God to search our hearts and for us to be honest with ourselves of where we can grow and, of course, to be made more and more into the image of Christ. However, too often, I allowed my feelings about how I thought I was doing then to relate to how I would approach God. What level of confidence or what level of shame I would feel when approaching him. Thomas Merton stated, Quit keeping score altogether and surrender yourself with all your sinfulness to God who sees neither the score nor the scorekeeper but only his child redeemed by Christ. If I start to see myself and base my identity through my performance, especially when I think that I'm doing well, then is there any need any longer for the grace of God? That's one of the dangers that can happen if I were to do a self-evaluation and I think I'm doing pretty good. I become proud of my works, and in my heart, I'm no longer dependent on God's grace. It reminds me of a story of an older gentleman who showed up to his church's midweek service. And he shared with the group about how great he was doing and how he had not sinned that week. And next to him, as he's saying all this, his (laughs) wife is just shaking her head. (laughs) In his eyes, he hadn't committed any of the so-called great sins. And therefore, he saw himself completely capable on his own. May we never find our confidence based on our performance either. May we stop hiding and denying the reality of our sin. We need to stop concealing our wounds out of fear and shame. We must bring our darkness into the light so that that, so we can also be a light for others. Diedrich Bonhoeffer had said, guilt is an idol. But when we dare to live as forgiven men and women, we join the wounded healers and draw closer to Jesus. It's in this decision to bring ourselves out of hiding that brings us into the healing ministry of Jesus. We stand in the truth that sets us free and live out the reality that makes us whole. Augustine wrote, There can only be two basic loves, the love of God unto the forgetfulness of self, or the love of self unto the forgetfulness of God. And Thomas Merton stated, God is asking me, the unworthy, to forget my unworthiness and that of my brothers and dare to advance in the love which has redeemed and renewed us all in God's likeness and to laugh, after all, at the preposterous idea of worthiness. But yet, how often is that what we want? We want to earn it. We want to achieve it. I want to somehow attain something. And it's not about 
our worthiness. As we've so often talked about, it's about relationship. How we view ourselves at any given moment <coughs> may have little to do with who we really are. I may have attained an achievement or have a good self-image because I have the praise of others. And my inner voice may even say, you have arrived, even though there's really no truth in that self-concept. And then there might be times I sink into despair. My inner voice says, you aren't any good. You're a fraud. You're a hypocrite. And there's no true shape from that message either. 1 John verses four, <clears throat> chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Definitely lets me know I'm not perfected in love. And I'm sure you're there too. So even if someone is bad-mouthing me, saying all kinds of bad things about me, if the love of God is the core of my identity, I no longer seek revenge, punishment, or I'm fearful of what might happen. His love drives out fear. And I can now see this person through eyes of compassion. I've worked in the mental health field and Many of those I worked with hold on to who they are from things that have been said to them and done to them. Most of them have been ba very badly abused. And uh, their families often told them they're stupid from a young age on. One of my clients, back when she had arrived where I work, would always introduce herself when she first arrived by coming up and saying, Hi, I'm bipolar. She could not see herself other than someone who was developmentally disabled, and someone with a mental illness. Later, instead of introducing herself this way, she started to say that she didn't know who she was, which was progress. She didn't know who she was yet, but at least she was letting go of some of those things that she allowed to be part of her identity as she was starting to now figure out, who am I? Are there things that you have accepted as part of your identity? that you need to give up. God once showed me this picture. Imagine a butterfly. It's not very thrilled with who it is, but then it goes through this metamorphosis and it be, this caterpillar and it becomes a butterfly. Truly a new creation. A new and different self. Now imagine this butterfly, it doesn't accept these changes to itself, even though it's a different creation, still sees itself as just this ugly caterpillar, so it never spreads its wings and flies. Now imagine there's another caterpillar who's fine with how it looks, but there's always so much to do and there are too many others that depend on me. I need to stay important and take sure that every part of my life, whether it be my job, my finances, my family, my possessions, everything needs to be working right. Now this caterpillar also becomes a butterfly, but it doesn't want to really let go. And so it can't really go anywhere or very far because it's got so much luggage, because it wants to be prepared for every circumstance first. And so all this baggage is weighing it down from the freedom that could come with flight. And there's a third caterpillar who becomes a butterfly, realized it is a new creation, realized its wings and it began to fly and began to soar. But then one day while soaring, a high wind caught it off guard and pushed it into a rock. Now this butterfly became aware of the high winds of life and being frightened never flew as high again. 
would still fly, but rarely will take the chance to truly soar again. Now, which of these are you? First John 3 verse 1 states, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We naturally draw our identity based on our achievements, based on the company we keep, based on the way we look, on the adulation of others. For most of us, we like our circumstances, our finances, our relationships to find how we see ourselves. Let's look at how the Apostle John finds his identity. He could easily say, hey, I'm writer of one of the four Gospels. I perform many miracles. I am the one who God gave the revelation to. I mean, who else could say that? And yet, he does not find his identity in any of those things that he accomplished, even though they were godly things. John's identity is simply, I am the one that Jesus loves. I am the beloved of God. And as I see myself as the beloved... Now I also see others as the beloved of God. It's John who we would see would recline and would rest his head against the chest of Jesus, listening to, there to his heartbeat. May we follow in, the mind, in this mindset and find our identity as I am the one that Jesus loves. I am the beloved of God. Brennan Manning wrote, We need to radically define ourselves as the one beloved of God. God's love for you and his choice of you constitutes your worth. Accept that and let it become the most important thing in your life. The basis of my personal worth is not my talents, my possessions, not the esteem of others or my reputation. It's not receiving appreciation from parents or kids or teachers or bosses. It's not applause or people telling you how important you are. Will I choose to be skeptical? Or will I choose to be completely amazed and surrender in faith to the truth that I am the beloved of God? What do you think Jesus thinks of you? You discover what you actually believe about Jesus when you admit what it is you believe he thinks of you. Do you honestly believe that God likes you? Not just that God loves you because he's love, and so then he has to, right? But do you really believe that God likes you? Can you and I honestly say, yeah, my daddy, you know what? He's very fond of me. Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Creator of the universe thinks precious thoughts about you too and numerous to count? Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. Isaiah 43 says, You are precious and honored in my sight. Romans 5, 5 tells us that God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. The Bible tells us the greatest commands are to love God and to love others. Only as I find my identity as the one loved by Jesus, embracing that I am the beloved of God as the core truth of my existence, can I then respond to and love others without prejudice? This truth will affect the way I relate to others. I've worked in the mental health field for about 15 years now. And I have been cussed out and threatened well over a thousand times, at least. Now, if I see this person as the beloved of God, it begins to change how I view them and relate to them. How will I respond to those who are different? 
to the drunk homeless man, to the person who's snobbish toward me and maybe won't give me the time of day? How will I respond to those who would interrupt me or gossip about me or even belittle me? Having the compassion of God in our hearts opens up our eyes to see the unique worth of each person, a worth that's not based on their present performance. Do you see yourself through the appearance of your new creation? <clears throat> Are you so weighed down by your responsibilities and your importance, or have you been hit by the high winds of life? and allowed fear to keep you from soaring again. In John 10, 10, Jesus states that he came so that you could have life and have it to the full. Sociologists have a theory that's called the looking glass cell. You become what the most important person in your life thinks you are. This could be your parents, your spouse, your kids, your boss, whoever would be the most important person in your life. How would your life change if you truly believed, truly believed the Bible's astounding words about God's love for you? What a gift would that be this Christmas if you would start to look in the mirror and you would see yourself and be like, I am the one that Jesus loves. I am the beloved of God. Could we start to see ourselves as God sees us? If you've ever flown on a plane, you start off at ground level and everything looks pretty big. Everything looks what we would call normal, right? But then what happens as the plane takes off? Everything starts to get smaller. The houses get smaller, the cars get smaller. Pretty soon as you've gotten pretty high up there, you can glimpse the whole city in the glimpse of an eye. Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. If you can't see yourself through God's eyes, maybe you need a new perspective. Just as when you fly, the higher you get, the smaller everything in the world begins to seem. Spend time alone with God. Surrender your circumstances to Him and worship Him. And as you are raised into the heavenly realms, you can look down at what seemed insurmountable and say, Oh, look, little problems. As you have a new perspective. This new perspective will help how you look at others as you realize your own identity. What is that identity? I'm a child of the King. I am the one Jesus loves. I am the beloved of God. But will we believe it? Will we truly accept it as the core of our identity? I'm a child of the King. I'm the one Jesus loves. I am the beloved of God. Even as someone who's been in Christ for years, I need to remind myself of that. Will we accept that as the core of our identity and then also begin to see others as the beloved of God? Lord, help us to see ourselves and others the way you would see us. Thank you, Lord, for we do not even begin to understand the vastness and greatness of your love. But you have thoughts for us, Lord, that are innumerable. We exalt you, Lord, and thank you that you have not just come to set us free, but that you have brought us into your kingdom as sons and daughters and heirs with all the rights and privileges that we would accept, Lord, who we are you have made us yours that we are family with all rights and privileges lord that we are your beloved we exalt you god